This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Hello, friends, and welcome back. Today, I will be talking about some warnings for the church and also encouragement for the church. But before I get into that, I just want to remind you that if you have any questions or comments, anything you'd like me to talk about, any feedback you'd like to give me, you can send an email to me at mike at ancientpaths.faith. There's also a YouTube channel and a Facebook group that you could join in and have some conversations that way as well. I recently had interaction with a few listeners. Uh, Just yesterday, a friend of mine who listens to the podcast, he's in a different country, called. He was listening to the most recent podcast episode, and what I was talking about was really very much speaking directly to him. Of course, I didn't know that it would uh, touch him in the way that it did. I bring it up because what I have shared in the podcast is a result of me praying and asking the Lord, what do you want me to share? I heard a teacher say uh, one time that he considered his ministry to be prophetic preaching, meaning that he would pray and listen to the Lord, what the Spirit had for him to share, in specific circumstances for specific groups. And even though I don't know all the people that are listening now or in the future, uh, the topics that I talk about are a result of praying about, well, God, what do you want me to share? Well, it's not a surprise then that what I say would have some effect or bear some good fruit, because if we speak the Word of God, uh, the truths of God, His Word is living and active, and it has an effect. My Word, Mike Cantrell's Word, is not living and active. And uh, I said to somebody recently, I hope what I share in the podcast is not novel, I hope I don't share anything that's new, but I hope that I share things that are fresh. Just as in the book of Proverbs, you can go through and read the same thing you've read many times, and yet something will jump off the page at you and say, yeah, that's that's God's good word for me today in my circumstances. I encourage everyone who's listening to have that same attitude as you go into conversations, as you're talking with people. Don't stay at the shallow level. Go deep. Go as deep as you're able. And listen for what the Lord would have you share as you talk with people. Or send an email or send a text message or however you communicate. Be praying and see, does the Lord have something for the person you're talking to? At the same time, we should all keep our ears open as well to hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. All right, so I want to get into this topic, warnings and encouragement for the church And the context is a series of teachings that we've had at our local fellowship about the church. What is the church? The church globally, the local church. We've had several different teachers present different aspects of that topic. And it's been very, very good as we are fighting hard to build unity in our local congregation. The teachers have felt that it was very important to talk to the people at the church. What is the church? Our church has lots of students from lots of different countries, many different cultures. A lot of different uh, Christian traditions are represented in our meeting. And so people come from different places and different experiences and different teachings. So part of our work to create unity is to teach what the Bible says about, well, in this case, the church. I guess I will mention a couple of things here. First, the church is people not buildings. That's very clear in the scriptures that the church is not buildings. Uh, You can have a church and meet in a field. (laughs) And a lot of times we will use the word church to refer to the building, uh, which is not wrong, I guess. It's a church building. But if you say, we got to get somebody to church, uh, just realize you're talking about the people, the relationships, not the location. Also, one of the things we've been talking about is how God has different forms for different fellowships. 
And this is a good way to understand it. To be honest, it's not in the scriptures, but it's helped me a lot to think of forms. For instance, if you have a teacup and a bucket, well, they're different shapes, they're different forms, but they're both created to hold something. Churches can look very different. Uh, I was telling some friends recently about cowboy churches in Texas. They take a different form. I saw a picture of a cowboy church. Everybody is sitting on hay, bales of hay. That's what they sit on in that church. And another thing about cowboy churches in America is they have huge parking lots because the cowboys are driving pickup trucks with uh, trailers, big trailers behind them. you got to have a lot of room to park things. Other churches meet in small buildings, in small rooms. Our church meets in, you know, a building in the city. So God has different forms for churches, and yet churches are made, that form is there to hold the Spirit of God, because the church is people, not buildings. So when I was asked to speak recently, I began to feel that I should warn our fellowship about certain things that God had put on my heart, and also encourage our fellowship, our specific church. So I'll just read through the scriptures that were on my heart and share a few things that we had for our local church, and I hope that they are an encouragement to you or will catch your ear. After I spoke, one of the young men in the church came up and told me that what I was sharing was exactly what he was facing, certain aspects of how the church can be attacked in different ways. So warnings. It's not warning the believers to be better people. It's uh, warnings about how the church can be attacked and what kind of troubles we need to keep our eyes open for. Okay, so the first scripture was 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I'll read it and, as usual, say a few things about it afterwards. I want to say before I read it, this section is really helpful to me. Uh, it describes very well where I believe the culture, the global culture is right now. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting at the beginning of the chapter. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. Well, that's what Paul is saying to Timothy and I believe it's a word for us today, and it's a warning to our churches. It's a warning to Christians. In the last days, there will be terrible times. Uh, first, I guess I want to say we shouldn't presume that we're moving towards a glorious and happy future unless we pass through these terrible times in the last days. There is a glorious and wonderful future, but that's after this world is destroyed and the new heavens and the new earth come to us. Mark this. Remember, there are going to be bad times in the last days, and these terrible times will be marked by how people will be lovers of themselves and lovers of money. When I read that, I think, well, there's so much pressure in our culture to teach people, to encourage people to love themselves, pamper themselves. A lot of advertising is based exactly on this idea Love yourself. You deserve the best. Lovers of money, my goodness, boastful, proud, abusive, and disobedient to their parents. Isn't that interesting that rebellious children are a mark of terrible times in the last days? I'm not just talking about children that are under the age of 18. You may be 30 or 40 years old, and still you're a child of your parents. And we need to honor our fathers and our mothers so that it'll go well for us. And that's one of the commandments, the first commandment, with a promise to it. If we honor our parents, then things will go well. We'll have a long life. Also, right after that, disobedient, you know, rebellious children, ungrateful. If we're not thankful, that's a mark of terrible times. 
Can we be content with what the Lord has given us? Can we be thankful for even the hard things that he's given us? When we pray before our meals, I'm always very purposeful that the first thing I say is thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Even when we're going through very, very hard things, God is going to use those hard things for good, and we can be grateful for them. It may not be fun, but we can be grateful for them. Other things that are in this list, a no love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, treacherous, conceited, hedonistic uh, would be the word for the next thing, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Yeah, well, if you love pleasure, you're a hedonist, and you're seeking after yourself and your own pleasure rather than surrendering life to follow God, to love God. And here in verse 5 is something that is my warning, what I believe is a warning for our local church, and it's a warning for all of us. These people that are mentioned are church people. They have a form of godliness. They may go to church, may sing the hymns, may be participating in some ministry, and yet they can be lovers of themselves or love money. I'm sure you've seen this happen in the church, and perhaps you have been this kind of person in your local church. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of God. And the power of God is for transformation, that we would repent and be purified and no longer be lovers of ourselves, no longer love money, no longer be treacherous, no longer be slanderous, gossiping. Jesus, in so much of his ministry, condemns the hypocrites. And these are people in the terrible times who have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. And then the final thing in this little section is, Paul says, have nothing to do with them. Now, he doesn't mean don't evangelize. Uh, don't hang out with people. He, he's not saying that, but these people that are doing these things and they pretend to be godly, we should really have nothing to do with them. Isn't that something? Well, that's what Paul said to Timothy, have nothing to do with them. Sometimes the best response to somebody who is being divisive or talking about different contentious items or things that are in the church is really just to ignore them, just to have nothing to do with them. Uh, sometimes the best thing is you see trouble coming and you go the other way. So that's a warning, a warning to the church. There will be terrible times in the last days, and these terrible times will be marked by people who have all of these qualities. And we have to be careful. We need to, well, dare I say, have an exodus. We need to leave that corrupt system. We need to come out of that. All right, Second Peter chapter 2, and this is something that's been on my heart for our church in particular, because lots of our students are coming from cultures where there are what I believe to be false prophets. So we'll start in Second Peter chapter 2 and then move on to uh, Matthew. All right, Second Peter chapter 2. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. That's the first sentence there in Second Peter chapter 2. In the Old Covenant, when the Lord was speaking through his prophets, there were false prophets. And under the New Covenant, in very much the same way, there are going to be false teachers among us. And here's what Peter says about these false teachers. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they've made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. So that's what Peter is saying. It's a warning. This is a warning to the church. There are going to be false teachers among the church. And they're going to secretly bring things in to the church that will draw people away, even to the point of denying Jesus and the price that he paid on the cross. And I know this is true even in Christian seminaries, where they deny that Jesus existed. Historically, he didn't exist. And some would even argue that it doesn't matter if he existed or not, because the ideas are what are important. 
And yet that's not what the scriptures present. And if Jesus was not crucified, if he was not raised from the dead, then our faith is in vain. That's scriptural, but that's a shameful teaching. And in their greed, says these teachers are going to exploit us with stories that they've made up. That's a warning. But what do we do? How do we respond? The most important thing is to know the scriptures. Each of you, each of us, every person, not just the staff at church, not just the teachers at church, every single Christian needs to know the Word of God. We need to know the Scriptures. And then when a teacher brings something up, we'll be able to identify, well, that's not in the Scriptures. That's not the Word of God. Many years ago, I was at a church in the United States, and the preacher said, the road to salvation is very wide. He said it with enthusiasm, and people were encouraged and happy. And I thought, well, that's exactly the opposite of what Jesus said. The Lord said, the road to destruction is very wide, but the path of life is very, very narrow, and few find it. And yet this preacher was trying to be inclusive, trying to be encouraging, trying to say, yeah, the way to God is very wide. It's easy to find it. You can get there. Don't be discouraged. You'll make it. And I thought, well, that's just, that's a false teaching. How could you say something that's the exact opposite of what Jesus himself said? Now, there are teachers on the internet. They may not come into our local church in person, but we have people within the church who are listening to these other teachers. It's very easy to have access to people who call themselves prophets or apostles or teachers. And this is the thing that the young man in our church was talking about when he came to me after I shared. He said that he had been watching uh, this one apostle, I think it was, on YouTube, and this man's teachings had begun to cause the fellow in our church to question his faith. Terrible fruit from this teacher. We have to be careful. There are false teachers, and there are people that preach and teach on the internet and they, they have really rotten doctrine, but they're great on screen. They're really good in front of a camera. They're very engaging. There was a pastor of a very famous church in the USA. I won't mention it right now. Uh, but he, boy, he was great if you watched his videos. He was just really engaging guy. His doctrine was questionable. And then it came out later that the staff of the church was just being beat down by him personally that he was hard on people and rough on people, and there was a lot of, well, a lack of integrity in his life. But you could watch him on a video and say, well, that guy's really good. So we got to be careful about that. We have to be very, very discerning because these false teachers are going to try to build up their own kingdoms, and they're going to bring in false teachings, even to the point of denying Jesus. I'll mention it again, something that I heard a while ago. One Bible teacher was saying, I don't want to engage in speculation and call it teaching. And I think that happens a lot. And when we're listening to someone who's teaching or preaching, are they just speculating, thinking out loud, and then calling it teaching? I spoke at a church. This was actually pretty fun. In Uganda one time, it was up in the mountains over in western Uganda. And I talked about hope. And hope is described at one point as being like an anchor. It holds fast in the Holy of Holies. And so I was explaining it to him, and I saw a lot of sort of blank looks coming back at me. And most of the people at the church had never seen a boat. They didn't really know what an anchor was. They hadn't been to a lake. They were just way up in the mountains there. And so I had to describe, you know, what is a boat and what does an anchor do? So you could get this idea of what hope is, how it holds fast, and it's it's a place of security. That's what hope is. Well, a little later, actually the next time I was in Uganda, I spoke to the pastor of that church, and uh, what I had shared on hope had really encouraged him. And I asked him, I said, what are, you, what are you teaching on these days? And he said, oh, I'm talking, still talking about hope, what hope is. And I said, well, well you know, what are you saying about it? And he started sharing his own thoughts and honestly, his own speculation about hope. There was no mention of Scripture. There was no mention of God, no mention of being a good disciple. It was just his thoughts about what hope probably was. 
and he was speculating and calling it teaching. And what he was sharing with me was a little bit chaotic and disconnected and didn't really have a line of thought through it, which is what teachers should be trying to do is bring people along in a line of thinking. So we need to be careful about that. We need to be cautious. And James says in James chapter 3, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Well, that's a caution as well. Isn't that a warning? Uh, Not too many of us should presume to be teachers. And I take this warning very, very seriously. It's terrible to lead a follower of Jesus or a young person, a baby in the faith, into sin. It's terrible. It's better to be thrown into the sea with a stone tied around your neck than to cause someone to sin. And if we don't teach correctly, we are leading people astray, actively leading them astray. I think many teachers that are on the internet, they're making disciples of themselves, not disciples of Jesus. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. They're building their own kingdom. Money, fame, these things can corrupt people who started well but end badly. And we've seen that happen. Well, that could happen to me, and that could happen to you. So we need to be cautious. It's a warning to us. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus gives the same warning. He says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And then therefore, by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So here's a warning from the Lord himself. We need to watch out for false prophets. They will come in sheep's clothing. They will come like the sweetest, greatest person, most fatherly or motherly, but inwardly they are going to tear us apart. And we can tell these false prophets by their fruit. Are they actually making disciples of Jesus? Are their followers being set free from sin? Are their followers having the fruit of the Spirit? I have been in ministry for a long time and in a wide variety of settings in different cultures and countries. In those years, I have crossed paths multiple times with ministry leaders who I call tanks. And you know what a tank is. A tank is a military vehicle that's huge and heavy and has a big gun, these big tracks, and it can just move, it can drive over trees and just move and do a tremendous amount of work, get a lot of things done. But behind it, it leaves wreckage. And I have experienced and witnessed tanks, church leaders, ministry leaders who are like tanks. They get a huge amount done, but they leave wreckage behind them. They leave broken people. Uh, One of the markers of these kinds of leaders is that they think of the people around them or the people in their fellowship as tools to accomplish their ministry. And I've seen, man, I've seen this happen so much. They're charismatic. People will follow them and then they'll give their lives to the ministry and the vision of the, the leader, this false prophet, false pastor. And then they get used up and spit out and you can see it. You see the fruit of that leadership. You see the fruit of that work Once you see that fruit, you say, well, my goodness, that's not of the Lord. That's chewing people up and spitting them out. That's not encouraging them and building them up in the faith and and then helping them to be disciples and helping them to do the work of the church. We have to remember that not everyone who says to Jesus, Lord, you're my Lord, not every one of those people is going to enter the kingdom of heaven because we can say, Lord, Lord, and not do what he says. Well, then he's not the Lord. He's not the boss. Jesus says, only the person who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, 
is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen? That's a, a warning, a very serious warning. We've got to watch out. And nowadays with social media and algorithms that feed us endless streams of what the computers think we want to see, we can have all kinds of garbage coming in and all kinds of false teaching. All right, well, that was the warning side. I'd like to now move on to the encouragement side. What are the things that we should be really pursuing? How should we be thinking? And I want to encourage you. The first thing is, and I don't remember if I've mentioned it in a previous episode, I had a friend in Texas who grew up uh, just a pretty simple life out in a small town, and the Lord called him to lead a seminary in a Middle Eastern country. I won't mention what it is. I think the seminary is still functioning. This would have been 30 years ago or so. So if you're going to lead a seminary, you've got to learn how to speak Greek and Hebrew. And so he had come from the small town in Texas and was in the graduate degree program learning Greek and Hebrew. I talked to him one time and I said, what's the most important thing about the missionary life? And it's funny that I asked him this because I had no idea that later I would live internationally. Uh, But he was getting ready to graduate and go off and be the leader of the seminary. And he said, when I asked him what's the most important thing, he said, the principle of abiding. That's the most important thing. The principle of abiding. And that has stuck with me for so long. I don't know. I probably should have mentioned this in my series on foundations. The principle of abiding. So we see this in John chapter 15. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must abide in the vine. And neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man abides in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, those are the words of the Lord Jesus. Amen. The principle of abiding is the most important thing. And I want to encourage you to abide. Abide in the Lord, just as a branch abides in the vine, stays connected to the vine. If you don't know what that means, if it's kind of confusing language to you and you don't really know exactly what I'm talking about, then you ask the Lord Jesus to teach you. You ask him, don't ask me. Say, Lord, I don't understand this really. I don't know exactly what it is. What does that mean? Would you please show me? Well, that step itself is abiding in him, right? We don't need to learn more about him in order to draw closer to him. We draw close to him so we can learn about him. That's what a disciple is. You walk with him. You don't make a decision after you know everything. You start walking with the Lord. You abide in him. And then you'll learn. Then you'll know from experience. Not just in the head. Not just emotionally, but spiritually. What is this abiding that Jesus is talking about? And a few things I want to mention here about what he said here in John 15, just as an encouragement to you. A branch that doesn't bear fruit, it gets cut off. But a branch that does bear fruit gets pruned. This is real important. There are times when we're abiding in him and we're involved in fruitful ministry. We can't take credit for it because the fruit is the natural result of us abiding in him. It's The branch doesn't bear responsibility for the fruit. It's the flow of life from the vine through the branch. And as we go through times of bearing fruit, the Lord will prune us. And that means cutting off the stuff that bore the fruit. (laughs) And I've had that happen several times in my life where I'm in the middle of things that everything seems to be going really good in the ministry. And then suddenly... Things are disappearing and they're getting cut off and what was fruitful is no longer there. And I've had this tendency to think, God, why are you punishing me? And now I realize, well, he's just pruning me. He's preparing me for the next season. And my understanding is that when you're growing grapes, the branches that bear grapes, you have to cut them back 
because for the next season, they will keep growing, but they won't bear as much fruit. And then the life that's in the vine will give energy to this fruitless growth. But the Lord wants the fruit. He wants to see that fruit, that eternal fruit. And so he'll cut back things. And, well, it's certainly served to keep me humble. If I could start getting a big head and bragging about all the good stuff I've done, well, if the Lord cuts it off, like, man, that's humbling. That is really humbling. And it's always good to be humbled. Let me say that again. I think that's for somebody who's listening right now. It is always good to be humbled. It just means that we die to ourselves more. We recognize that anything that's good that comes from within us is from God, which is exactly this image that the life comes from the vine through the branches. The life is not in the branch. The life is in the vine. And then Jesus says, if you abide in me, I will abide in you. Boy, what a promise. I read an article recently, a man who had recently come to faith in Christ, an older man. I think he was a professor somewhere in the Far East. I can't remember exactly. He had started reading the scriptures, and then he put his faith in Jesus. And somebody asked him, what is it in the Bible, what is it about Christianity that changed your mind and brought you into this relationship, into this faith in Jesus? And he said, well, it was when I was reading, I can't remember which epistle, he said, I just realized in Christianity, the promise is that God comes into his people. No other religion in the world makes that promise that God comes into his people. Well, there you have it. This is what Jesus is talking about. If you abide in me, I will abide in you. And the Lord says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. And we can't be fruitful unless we remain in him, unless we abide in him. One of the hardest teachings, and it will make it into my list of the exclusive claims of Jesus, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Wow, what a claim for a carpenter from Nazareth. All right, the next encouragement is, and this is how I introduced it to the church the other day, I said, who here wants to know the truth? Well, um, (laughs) it was funny. Not everybody raised their hand, I guess, because they figured, you know, it's just kind of a rhetorical question. But it was funny. I said, who here wants to know the truth? And, you know, 80% of the church raised their hands. So we had a laugh about that. Well, I've talked about this before, but I was encouraging the church with it, and I'll encourage you again. Who believes that the truth will set you free? Who believes that Jesus said that? And who believes this saying, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free? Well, do you believe that's true? I do, but that's not exactly what Jesus said. It's not completely what he said. And I have talked about this in depth in previous episodes. What the Lord said, and this is in John chapter 8, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. This is one big, long if-then statement. And if I may, I'd like to add a few more thens into this teaching, this word of Jesus. If you hold to my teaching, there's the if, then you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and then the truth will set you free. If we hold to his teachings, if we grab tight clasp his word to our hearts, then we're really his disciples. And once we do that, then we begin to know the truth and understand the truth. And then as we walk with the Lord and hold to his teachings, then we will be free because we know that truth. And we know it not just intellectually, but we know it from experience in our hearts, deep in our hearts. So here is, I think, an example of abiding in Jesus which is holding to his teachings, not believing that they're true and then just going off and do whatever we want to do, but really holding on to them and clasping them and refusing to let go of the teachings of Jesus. There was a young man in our church who his faith is being stretched a little bit right now, and he's trying to figure everything out in his head, in his mind. He's trying to 
comprehend things so that he can be a disciple. And my encouragement to him is, well, if you see that the Lord commands you in the scriptures to do something, do it, put it into practice. And then you're going to understand the truth that you're seeking as you put into practice, as you walk with the Lord. And then the other language would be as you abide in his teaching, then you'll know the truth and then you'll have freedom. Then you'll be set free, no longer enslaved. Amen. So that's my encouragement to you. Let's hold to the teachings of Jesus. Let's really be his disciples and walk with him and submit ourselves to him. And the promises, then we're going to know what we need to know and we'll be set free. Okay, I'm going to finish up now. And of course I say that, who knows how long it'll take me to finish up. Matthew 28, very familiar scripture. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. Well, I want to encourage you with a few things that we see here in what the Lord said. This is a word to his followers. And the word is not only that his followers should be disciples, but his followers should make disciples. This is not a word for the church staff. It's not uh, the commandment to only those who are paid to be involved in ministry or only those who have certain ministry gifts. This is the word to the disciples, to his followers. We are not only to follow him, but we're also to make followers of Jesus. And we've got to be careful that we're not making followers of ourselves. We're actually making followers of Jesus And to make disciples in all nations, right? So that means traveling, going, getting out of your comfort zone. There are a couple of things that we are to do as we go out and make disciples. And those two things are baptizing and teaching. The teaching is not teaching people what Jesus said. It's teaching people to obey what he said. And I want to focus on one little thing that I came across recently, hadn't thought about it. Jesus says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the name, right there, the word name is singular. Jesus didn't say baptizing them in the names of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's one name and then three mentioned after that. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It's one name. This is a statement that Jesus makes that clearly lines him up as equal to the Father, as God. It's a statement of his deity, and it's, I don't know, a precursor? It's a statement of the Trinity, of the the character of God, that the name of God is the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Those three, what seem to be plural, I mean, there's three, and yet they're one, yet it's singular, My encouragement to you is, and to myself, my encouragement to all who are listening, is to recognize that Jesus has authority, all authority, in the spiritual realm and in the physical realm that we're living in now. And because he has that authority, we are to go out and make disciples, and we're to baptize people, and we're to teach people to do what Jesus has commanded. We do that with the assurance that he is always with us, all the way to the very end of the age. Amen. Jesus said to his disciples, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Thank you for listening, and God bless you all.